Between 1967 to 1979, Macintosh produced this MC250 solid state stereo power amplifier. It was rated at 50 watts per channel into 4, 8, or 16 ohm loads at not more than 0.25% THD and its frequency response was listed at plus 0 to minus 0.25 dB from 20 Hz to 20 kilohertz. The listed price in the 1970 Macintosh price guide was $379 or in March 2024 US dollars it's about $3,000. It looks very similar to some of their tube designs around the time. I do think this is one of their early solid state power amplifiers. And this particular model you will see in a little bit was tested by the Macintosh labs in 1972. So I'm guessing this is about 52 years old. And from what I can tell it is pretty much all original. Now I will take off the bottom and show you what the inside looks like and you know we'll do a peek on the top and the sides and the front and the back and and then of course I will have some uh, data to show you on how this guy performed and then my listening tests and overall comments after using this Macintosh MC250. Here is what I would call the display side of the Macintosh 250 amplifier. A nice view of the filter caps, the auto formers, uh, the heat sinks for the output transistors are underneath the shield as you'll see in a little bit and here is the power supply transformer. Here is the business end of the Macintosh 250. We have gain controls here, our inputs are here. We actually have an unswitched AC outlet here. Uh, this plug could be used for outputs as well if you didn't want to use these. We do have a circuit breaker here and I've got the spade lug to banana uh, adapters on to make it easier. We have outputs for 4, 8, and 16 ohm speakers and here is our stereo mono switch. These are our gain controls and if you were running in mono you would be adjusting the right gain control for the uh, gain. Here is a view looking down on top of the Macintosh 250. You can see the heat sinks under here for the output transistors and here's our power supply transformer and our two auto transformers. Here is the other side view of the Macintosh 250. You can see uh, venting here to help it run cooler. And this obviously is the bottom view of the MC250, kind of showing how everything was built. It looks to me like it's all original. I can tell you that this capacitor right here, and you can kind of uh, see this little black thing here. Well, this capacitor had leaked out, I guess, right here. And I didn't notice it till after I had already done all my testing and gave it back to the owner and he was complaining that after a while the amplifier would turn off. Now you can see it has some thermal cutouts here so if it got real hot it would cut off. He said there was no harm. It would just shut off after a while and so I got it back. This was probably two months after I had measured it and, and he had it at home and in looking at it now you can just see that little uh, black thing and Basically what happened is this capacitor was open and this guy was really not very good. It, it did have some capacitance, but its CSR was real high and it, it wasn't anywhere near the amount of capacitance. So I replaced both these guys and let it run for several hours and it was fine at that point. It does look all original to me. Here we have the MC250 putting out a little over a watt into 8 ohms and the gain has been set for almost 27.5 dB. It just kind of gives you the performance. You can see our THDs are pretty well balanced at better than 0.02% and the SNRs are around 67 dB. 
Here we have the MC250 putting out a little over a watt into 4 ohms this time and I wanted to compare this to where it was putting out a watt into 8 ohms. Now I have the gain controls for both channels set the same. I haven't moved them throughout the testing. When we were into 8 ohm loads we were about 3 dB higher. We we're reading about 27.5 dB and here we're about 24.8 dB so, so not quite 3 dB difference. As far as the SNRs, they're pretty much the same. The THD is better in the 4 ohm case. Overall, the THD plus noise is pretty much the same. So it's also taking a little less signal input level to achieve the, the same output power as we did in the 8 ohm case. There is a specification for the frequency response at 1 watt into 8 ohms and it is plus 0 to minus 0.25 dB. So you can see right here we are at about minus 1 dB at 20 Hertz so we're off a little bit on that and then we're above uh, well 0 dB so we're about oh two tenths of a dB above right in here so we would be failing there and then we are a little bit beyond the 0.25 dB we're about 0.4 dB right there so we would be filling that but overall for something that is the age of this guy in all original I think it's doing pretty good. Here we have the MC250 putting out 1 watt into 4 ohm loads in this case the frequency response looks worse at the high end of the band with a 4 ohm load with the 8 ohm load, we were around maybe a half a dB here at 20 kilohertz. Here we're, oh, 1.8 to maybe 1.6 dB, depending on the channel. And the low end of the band, we're pretty much the same. It might be a tenth of a dB or so better with the 4 ohm loads, but for whatever reason, it does not look as good with a 4 ohm load at the high end of the frequency band. Here we have the MC250 putting out about 50 watts into 8 ohms per its specification. It should have a THD of better than 0.25% and we are indeed better than 0.25% THD. Also our SNRs are looking about 73-74 dB. Now there is also another specification for hum and noise which it says should be 90 dB below rated output so at 1 kilohertz we're at 0 and you would want everything to be below 90 dB which would be down below here. This is a hum spike from the power supply at 120 hertz so this guy right here would be down about oh, 65 dB so we would be failing the hum and noise and then this would be in the noise here in the, the 110 so it probably would be m making the noise requirement but not with the hum. And in case you're wondering what the harmonics look like, you can see that our third or odd harmonic over here is just a little bit higher than our second or even harmonic, which is what you would typically expect with a transistorized amplifier. Right now I'm going to increase the input signal level to get a higher output power and we'll see how much we can get out of this guy before our distortion gets really ugly. We'll say a half a percent. So we're at 67, 68 watts, and we're still under half a percent. Uh, it's looking really pretty ugly right there. I, I think we probably can go just a little bit more. The right channel is now at about half percent. The left channel uh, looks a bit better, but overall you're at about 71 watts, we'll call it, before it starts really looking pretty bad. Here we have the MC250 putting out about 50 watts into 4 ohm loads. Now one thing to note is that the gain controls have been kept the same throughout all my testing and we're showing a little less gain here into the 4 ohm loads, 25 dB versus about 27.6 dB when we were looking into 8 ohm loads and the SNRs are about 4 dB better into the 4 ohm load. THD is a tad better into the 4 ohm loads as well. Right now we're pushing about, oh we'll call it 69 watts into 4 ohm loads. Everything looks pretty nice. 
And just in case you were wondering what the harmonics look like, you can see here that our odd or third harmonic is still higher than the second or even harmonic. And I'm going to go ahead and bring the power up just a little bit more and see how much more we can get, if anything, out of the 4-ohm loads. We're at about the point where into 8-ohm loads it stopped working real well, but we're still doing pretty good. We're at 74 watts, 78 watts, so we're starting to get a little ugly here. And pretty close to 80 watts. We're still under 1% THD. We can probably go up just a little bit more. We'll say maybe 82 watts in the 4 ohm load, so that's kind of a good spot to call it quits for this guy, I think. This plot shows the MC250's output impedance from about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Now, if I use the value for the right channel's output impedance at 1 kilohertz, I will get a damping factor of about 19. The specification is the damping factor should be about 38 or better, so we're doing about half that. Here we have plot showing the THD versus frequency at a couple different output power levels, and that's into 8 ohms from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. The specification is that the THD should be better than 0.25%, and indeed it is. It really doesn't get above uh, 0.1%. The little minus 2.8 here is the equivalent of an output power of about 40 watts, and minus 14.8 is about 2.5 watts. So it kind of just shows you that over the power range that I measured, it had a pretty decent THD. Here is a plot of the MC250's IM distortion. In this case, I have a 19 and 20 kilohertz signal applied of equal value such that we're getting about 5 watts into 8 ohms. It's looking pretty good. If you do the math on this, you come up with an IM distortion that's less than 0.001%. It's, it's pretty darn low. This plot shows the MC250's crosstalk from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with the active channel putting out 5 watts into 8 ohms. They're pretty evenly balanced. You can see the crosstalk goes as low as maybe about 20 to 23 dB on up to the mid-50s at the low end of the frequency band. And there is no specification for it. It's just for entertainment purposes. Here is the multi-tone response of the MC250 with it putting out about 5 watts into 8 ohms. This would equate to between about 10 to 13 bits of distortion free range. Here is the system noise level of the MC250. In this case, both inputs are terminated into shorts and I do have the volume control set for about 27.4 dB of gain I think is where they're at. You can see that we have our 60 hertz humbar right here that's at minus 60 dBV and then you have some of these other uh, power supply related humbars here. My guess is that I'll probably hear the uh, hum when I hook it up to the speakers but it probably will not be that annoying. In this plot, the MC250's input signal level is increasing, and obviously the output power is increasing as well, and we're looking at the THD, and this is just done at 1 kilohertz, and you can see that at low power levels, which would be down in this area, uh, less than maybe oh, a watt, we'll say six-tenths of a watt, you're at 0.0. 0.3% THD, and as we get up to where we're hitting 80 watts, which would be right here, we're at not more than 0.1% THD. The specification is that it should be better than 0.25% THD, so it is definitely meeting that requirement. One thing I may not have mentioned is that the MC250 weighed about 36 pounds. It's pretty solid. During my testing, or listening testing anyway, it never really got uh, warm per se. Uh, during some of the more strenuous load testing I did, the top got a little warm, but I mean you could always hold your hand over the top of where the output transistors reside. As far as my using it, it has the terminal barrier strips on it for connecting your, your speakers to, and um, you know those are what they had at the time. 
Uh, I showed the picture with the adapters that you can use to convert to a banana jack and that's how I tested it and listened to it using those adapters. It just makes my life much simpler. And they're not that expensive to pick up those kind of things. As far as using it, I did clean and lube the gain controls just it's easy enough to do on this as well as the stereo mono switch and I did not test it in the mono mode just I didn't really see any big reason to do that you had to jumper some other wires and I thought it worked fairly well as far as the output power in the 4 and 8 ohm load cases and I didn't really see a point in putting it in a mono I'm guessing it would have met at least the power THD requirements which as you saw from the data it had really not a lot of problem with meeting the uh, power levels at uh, 50 watts. It actually can do a bit more than that into either 4 or 8 ohms. And the only thing that I thought it lacked was a bit of low frequency response. As you saw from the frequency response plots, both 4 and 8 ohm loads had that roll off. At the low frequency, I mean, I think it went up to several hundred hertz before it, it kind of leveled off and, and then it was okay and then it dropped down at the high end of the band to a bit more than what the original 52-year-old spec allowed, but you're, you're not going to hear much at 20 kilohertz, at least most of us aren't. I did connect this to my Wilson Watt 3 Puppy 2 loudspeakers. Those are kind of my reference loudspeakers for most listening. And the first thing I did was terminate the... Uh, inputs into shorts and listen for hum and hiss and there was just a little bit of hum not very you know not very loud not very bad kind of what you would expect after looking at the noise level but a few feet away you don't hear it it's not objectionable and there really wasn't any hiss that I could hear so that part was good I used my Carver C1 preamplifier to drive this into the Wilson Watt 3 Puppy 2s the only thing I did was boost up the bass a bit on the C1 because this does have a low frequency deficiency on this particular uh, unit. Uh, my guess is it probably could use some capacitors changed in the uh, power amp section. I quickly looked at the preamp section and it looked like that was fairly flat. So if I were to go in and try to improve that low frequency response, I would start on the uh, driver section to the power amps. But with the bass boosted a little bit by the C1, I thought it sounded really good. It's it's very clean sounding. It had plenty of oomph to drive the Wilson Watt 3 Puppy 2 loudspeakers to over 90 dB SPLs, maybe 92 dB I hit here and there, but it, it just sounded very clean and crisp. And, you know, it's a, a very nice amp. It, it looks great. I think I like this vintage look. If it were mine, I would replace the front uh, RCA jacks with some gold-plated ones. Or if, you know, you didn't want to go gold-plated and see that was obviously restored, you know, you could get some non-gold-plated ones. Because I think the connections where the uh, terminals from the jacks go in are a little loose. I did have to tighten them up and... Uh, and then it seemed okay, but if it were mine, I would probably spend the effort to do some cap replacement in this. However, you could certainly use it without doing anything to it for, you know, probably years to come if you'd like. And I thought it sounded just fine. If you have a chance to pick up a Macintosh amp for the right price, I always recommend doing it. I don't think you would be unhappy. And they do have that, that good look to it. So... Anyway, that's kind of my take on it. I look forward to your comments, and I do try to reply to all of them. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please do so. That's kind of the only thing I ask. It, it gives me more motivation to bring you videos and keep me off the streets at night. <laughs> if you like the video, of course, thumbs up. Everybody tells you that. It helps with the algorithm mechanism that YouTube uses. So, once again... I thank you for watching, and until next time, have a great day or night.